All right, guys, welcome to week six. You've learned about the 24 steps in the innovation process. Now we'll focus on venture creation. After completing this unit, you should be able to do the following. One, identify corporate filings and agreements commonly used by early stage biomedical ventures. Two, identify stakeholders, shareholders, and their internal roles and responsibilities in an early stage biomedical venture. Three, draft an investor acquisition plan with investor profile and persona. Four, calculate pre-money and post-money valuation for a biomedical venture. Let's look at where in the business life cycle you might form your new venture. Venture formation usually takes place sometime in the innovation stage, but it can vary from the beginning, middle, or end. Remember in step zero when we talked about starting with an idea, a technology, or a passion? Well, that idea, technology, or passion often evolves into a project before it is fully formed as a separate corporate entity. In some cases, this project may go through the entire innovation stage due to formation. Venture formation is typically triggered by one or more of the following. Investment, whether it's from the founders or outside investors. Participation, such as when co-founders want to share ownership of the idea or technology with each other or other employees or vendors. Or by protection, when the founders wish to limit their personal liability by working through a corporate entity. Once you've determined that it's time to form a new venture, you need to get a grasp on the stakeholders and shareholders that are going to be involved in your venture. Stakeholders can affect and direct your business in various ways and to varying degrees. So, what's a stakeholder? It's an individual of an organization with an interest or concern in your venture. They can be inside or outside of your organization. For example, the people that make up the decision-making unit are stakeholders. The FDA may be a stakeholder. Your investors and co-founders are both stakeholders and shareholders. Your employees, vendors, and strategic partners are stakeholders, and they may also be shareholders in some cases. So, what is a shareholder? A shareholder is an individual or organization that owns one or more shares in your venture. Your shareholders, which may beyond, extend beyond investors to include co-founders, employees, and some vendors, can end up controlling your business, so it's important to be thoughtful about who you allow to participate as a shareholder. An individual or an organization might be very important to your business, but that doesn't necessarily mean they should be a shareholder. If you've never created or worked in a business before, you might be surprised to find out just how much time is spent engaging and managing stakeholders. It might seem like common sense, but prioritizing stakeholders and determining which ones should be involved in which activities or decisions can play a critical role in the success or failure of your venture. We can organize stakeholders into three groups, primary, secondary, and excluded. Primary are often those internal stakeholders engaged in economic transactions, so this may include stockholders, customers, suppliers, creditors, and employees. Secondary stakeholders are usually external with no economic exchange, but they are affected by the actions of the business. This might include the general public, communities, activist groups, industry organizations, and the media. The third class of stakeholders are excluded stakeholders. These are the disinterested individuals or groups that have no economic interaction with the business, though this classification can also extend beyond people to include environmental and humanitarian stakeholders such as plants, soil, rainforests, and anim animals in the laboratory or wild. In this section, we'll talk about why you're probably going to need one or more co-founders for your biomedical venture. However, before we move on from our discussion of stakeholders and shareholders, let's talk about choosing your co-founders, partners, and investors very carefully. You could be spending the next 10 to 20 years with these people, and it will go much smoother if you're aligned around values, mission, goals, objectives, and other factors that might seem like nitty-gritty, but can be critical, like communication styles, financial expectations, work ethic, roles and responsibilities, and more. Incompatibility across these areas leads to conflict, and far too often it results in the demise of what could have otherwise been a successful venture. This will become the foundation of your corporate culture, and because you probably the majority, spend the majority of your waking life at work, it will have a profound impact on your quality of life and well-being. Choose wisely. You can't be certain that most investors are evaluating these factors when they're considering an investment in your venture. Recent challenges at Uber illustrate the importance of values, ethics, character, and culture, and the impact they can have on a business.
Entrepreneurship and venture creation is a term is a team sport, especially if your venture is biomedical. Even if you knew how to do it all, which you don't, you wouldn't have enough time to do it all. If you are starting the venture, the good news is that you get to build the rest of your team around you. Start by asking yourself what role you're going to play. Of course, this should be based on skills, interests, training, and experience. A common characteristic of many successful biomedical ventures is the three-part engineering, medical, and business structure, or what I like to call the biomedical founder's triangle. Medtronic is one of the earliest examples of this three-part medtech triangle, but you'll find this in many biomedical companies, and you should strongly consider following this structure in the early stages of your venture. In the startup or innovation phase, the triangle is typically a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio, so that means that if you're the engineer founder, you'll need to find a medical co-founder and one business co-founder. That structure might be sufficient to make it through the innovation stage, but as you move into incubation and through acceleration, the ratios will change dramatically, and the number of business people will far outnumber the engineer and medical folks. Keep in mind that not everyone is full-time. While it's ideal to have access to your co-founders 24-7, the reality is that you probably don't need everyone at full-time employment in this stage, and you almost certainly won't be able to afford them full-time, especially when they're experienced. You're probably going to be wearing many hats, so get used to it. As you go through this exercise of identifying co-founders, defining roles, and assigning responsibilities, you're going to realize that the reality of early-stage ventures is that you're going to need to wear many hats. You'll also find that some fit you better than others. Some you'll gladly give up and some you'll hold on to for dear life. You'll also find that you'll need to collaborate with co-founders and many other as team groups. One day you'll be doing a test. The next day you might be supporting the person and doing tasks and acting as a manager. And soon you might be delegating management to someone else. As you go through this process, you might find it helpful to create modular roles that you can reassign to yourself or others. Similar to creating our feature logs and bins in the product roadmap of step 24, you'll find that some other roles require common skills, equipment, or other factors that cause you to group them together. This is much easier to do when you have the engineering, medical, business structure in place. It provides the framework for organizing roles and tasks into those three buckets. From there, you might consider using something like the roles and responsibilities triable above to design various roles. To continue with our earlier example, if you're an engineering founder and looking to shape the business role as you seek a business co-founder, you might start grouping functions like capitalization, sales, marketing, and business development together and assign them to that new co-founder. While these modules may frequently get defined, redefined, assigned, and reassigned during the innovation stage, eventually they'll stabilize and stop moving around so much and will then evolve into job descriptions that you can use to scale into the acceleration stage. Co-founders are one layer of your organization, and you may need to go through a similar process with potential board members, advisors, management, and team members. Once you've figured out who you need on your innovation team and what they're going to be doing, it's time to figure out how you are going to engage them. Are they going to be full or part-time? If they're part-time, how many hours is that? Or are they on board just for the specific project? Are they going to be employees, independent contractors? While employment agreements and independent contractor agreements are common in organizations at every stage in the business life cycle, you'll need to figure out which is appropriate for the relationship you're creating, or your attorney will need to help you. There's still a lot of questions to answer, and often this is a negotiation process between co-founders and often their legal counsel. It might be helpful to agree upon and document the general terms of the employment agreement or independent contractor agreement before engaging in legal counsel, but every situation is unique. How will your innovation team be compensated? Will they be paid in cash? Will they be paid in equity? Will it be a combination of cash and equity? Will the equity fully vest on day one or will there be some longer term incremental vesting plan? If you have experienced advisors on board, they might be able to help you navigate these questions and reduce your legal expenditures. There are a lot of questions to answer and decisions to make but th that also have a legal ta and tax implications, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. We'll see more in the next section as you prepare to form the new corporate entity.
So, it's time to form your legal entity and prepare the legal documents that establish the rights of the members or shareholders, empower the management team, and engage the team members. Like regulatory reimbursement that we covered earlier in the course, this is another area that you'll be sure to want to budget for outside expertise to guide your biomedical venture through the early stages. We'll introduce you to some of the concepts and common tools used, but again, every business is unique and there is a complex area that requires expertise and professionals. In fact, many businesses may engage in multiple attorneys specializing in different areas of law such as intellectual property, labor, tax, and securities. First, you might consider filing articles of organization if your entity is going to be a limited liability company or articles of incorporation if your business is a corporation. However, before you file, you'll need to decide in which state you should file. While it's common for many businesses to file in Delaware, that doesn't mean it's the right decision for your venture and these decisions that could have long-term implications on your business. Second, you might consider drafting an operating agreement or partnership agreement to document the terms and conditions of the relationship between partners and the business. This might define how profits and losses will be distributed, who is managing the business, what authority managers have or do not have, financial reporting and accounting practices, and more. Once you've formed your corporate entity and empowered managers or members to operate the business, the business can now engage employees, independent contractors, and vendors. While it might seem pretty straightforward to hire an employee or an independent contractor, there are legal and tax implications to each decision that you may need to consult an attorney or so consider this when building the budget for your biomedical venture. You may also need other documents, such as contribution agreements to document assets transferred from founders or partners into the business. You may have some, some time equity, option warrant, or other incentive participation management that rewards managers, employees, contractors, or others for the work that they've contributed to the business. And if you're raising outside capital, you may need another set of agreements to document the investment and define the relationship between the company and its investors. If that's not intimidating enough, you may want to ensure that these documents work together and don't conflict or contradict each other. Three common types of funding for early stage biomedical ventures include grants, debt, and equity. These are listed in what are generally the terms of preference for founders and existing shareholders. Grants are non-dilutive capital sources, meaning they do not dilute the ownership of existing shareholders and are not paid back. Similar to grants, debt is non-dilutive, unless it comes with terms that allow it to be converted to equity, referred to as a convertible note, which is fairly common in early stage ventures. Unlike grants, debt, or a loan, as it is also called, does not need to be repaid over an agreed upon term or an agreed upon date. Lenders providing the debt capital will expect to be paid interest that is appropriate for the level of risk associated with the borrower. To reduce the risk for lenders, debt can be secured or collateralized meaning the borrower agrees to forfeit some other asset of value to the lender if they do not pay the loan, also referred to as default. While it is generally preferable for ex existing shareholders of an early stage biomedical venture to use debt to capitalize the business instead of equity, the reality is that few lenders are willing to loan money to unproven businesses with little or no revenue. Therefore, founders often turn equity investors to capitalize their early stage ventures. An equity is a stock or any other security representing an ownership interest. While you may all be familiar with stocks of public companies like Apple or Google that are traded on exchanges, it's unimaginable that your early stage biomedical venture would obtain its capital from an initial public authoring. Rather, most early stage biomedical ventures are private company, capitalized by private sources. Common types of grants for biomedical ventures include the SBIR, Small Business Innovation Research, program and the STTR, Small Business Technology Transfer Program, are federal, federal grant programs offered by the United States Small Business Administration. Other grants may be available from charitable foundations and other non-federal governmental agencies. Occasionally, the grant funding sources may provide alternative programs that are structured as debt. However, the most common debt sources are banks, but they're certainly not the only lenders. As mentioned in the funding type section, Many private investors will use convertible notes that start as a loan and accrue interest before they are eventually converted to equity. Typically though, investors are interested in early stage biomedical ventures aren't looking for interest. They're looking for a sizable multiple on their principal investment. 
In most early stage ventures, it is very common that founders, their family, and their friends are the earliest investors. This stage is typically the highest risk in those investors generally investing in the friend and family member, not based on the fundamentals of the business. Venture capital invested in the innovation and incubation stage about 20, 40 years ago, but they now typically invest much better. Or at least they did for a period of time. Most angels now have moved into the late incubation and early stage acceleration. Corporate venture groups are typically investing around the same stage as other venture capital groups, if not later. Finding capital for early stage ventures is difficult, even more so for biomedical ventures. However, it's not impossible and recent changes to securities laws have made it possible for these early stage ventures to raise capital from an untapped market of non-accredited investors. However, the scale of securities is heavily regulated and complex. Like regulatory reimbursement and legal, this is an area where you'll need to budget for outside assistance. If you're pursuing grants, you'll need to complete grant proposals. Grant proposals are different from the documentation you'll prepare for a debt or equity raise, and they aren't subjected to the same regulations. Our focus here will be on raising equity and or debt. You've been going through the innovation and venture creation steps, and now you should have a budget detailing the amount of capital you'll need to take through your venture through the incubation stage. You've also learned about equity versus debt, so now it's time to make a decision about which one you'll use to capitalize your venture. Again, this is one of those areas where you'll want guidance from your investment bankers and attorney. Once you've made your decision, you'll move on to structuring your offering. While it's theoretically possible to raise capital without a perspective, a private placement memorandum or offering circular, it's not recommended for a variety of reasons. These offering documents are used by companies raising capital to advertise the availability in terms of their offering and provide disclosures to support due diligence for prospective investors. Whether you use a prospectus, a private placement mem memorandum, or a PPM, or an offering circular will depend on the type of offering. First, you'll need to determine if you qualify for an exempt offering. This is the assumption that every business raising capital is not exempt, so it is your responsibility to prove that you are exempt. If you are not exempt, this means you're required to file and report to the SEC as a public company. It's highly probable that you'll, be, that you'll use one of these exemptions for your offering. Keep in mind that exempt doesn't mean that you'll be exempt from the following rules of the Securities and Exchange Commission. It simply means that you're exempt from the filing and reporting requirements for a public company. Remember, the assumption is that every business raising capital is not exempt. So it is your responsibility to prove that you are exempt. Even if you qualify for one of these exempt offerings, you may still need to file your offering with the SEC. Here is an excellent table from the San Francisco law firm Morrison Forster that compares the various exempt securities offerings. The table highlights a few of the key characteristics that can be used to compare the offerings, including dollar limits, issuer requirements, investor requirements, filing requirements, and resale restrictions. Based on everything you know about your venture to this, including its capital needs, which exempt offering do you think would best fit your venture at this stage? Remember these steps aren't always sequential. What you learn in this section about investor acquisition might cause you to go back and revise the type of offering that would best fit your venture. That's okay, it's part of the process. So you've already learned how to segment a market. In step one, designing your innovative product and business, you learned how to pick a beachhead. In step two, build an end user profile. In step three, calculate the beachhead TAM. In step four, create a persona profile. In step five, identify your next 10 customers. In step nine, and determine your customer's decision-making unit or DMU. In step 12, once you realize that the op opportunity you're offering investors is also a product, an investment product, You'll see how you can apply what you've learned in all these steps to create an attractive investment product for your target investor. Seems like a lot of work, huh? And it is. Most entrepreneurs aren't willing to do it, which contributes to the low rate of success in raising early stage capital. Investors are shopping for high quality investment opportunities that fit their investment profile. It's up to you to communicate the key information quickly and concisely so that they can determine potential fit. The default answer is no, and, the, and it can be a long pass between a maybe and a yes. It's best on both sides if investors and issuers raising capital can quickly move to yes or no. One factor that your prospective investors will look at is valuation. 
Valuation is the current worth of your venture. We don't dive too deeply into the art and science of calculating valuations here, as there are numerous complex methods, and at the end of the day, valuation doesn't always match market value. The amount a buyer is willing to pay or the amount a seller is willing to accept is what's most important. What's important to understand is that your investors will either agree or disagree with your valuation. If they disagree, most will just pass on the investment and move on, and in certain offering structures, there really is no opportunity for negotiation. So it, so it really is take it or leave it. Think of valuation as pricing your venture. If you price it too low, you're leaving money on the table. If you price it too high, your investors will pass. As you're preparing to capitalize your venture, you'll want to be familiar with the terms pre-money valuation and post-money valuation. Pre-money valuation refers to the value of your venture before the investment. Post-money valuation refers to the value of the venture after the investment. To avoid arguments, our current value and simplify the investment process. It's not uncommon for investors to fund early stage companies without a current valuation. In these cases, the valuation will be set in the future as a discount to some or later offering.